Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Advisor with Stacey Chalevi. We have an amazing guest today. We have author Aaron Ryan, and he is a sci-fi uh, author. He writes amazing books. He has a series out right now, and he's coming out soon with his next book. And he has a book right now that he previously published that he's going to talk about also. But he has an amazing story, and he does amazing things with his storytelling and his books. And he is just a fabulous writer. So so we had to have him on the show because he's just amazing. So Ron, Aaron, why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Yeah, well, I'm, apparently I'm amazing. I'll take that adjective. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I'm i um, an author. I'm a sci-fi author. And I penned a what I thought was only going to be a single novel that just ballooned into a trilogy. And then it demanded two prequels. And I'm actually working on a follow-up. So it's going to be, I think the word is hexalogy. It is a pentalogy right now, which is five books. The fifth is with the editor, but it eventually is going to be a hexalogy uh, because I am actually, I've got the cover art for volume number four. Uh, wow. It's I know that's confusing, but some of it's, you'll see if you look at the pictures, the titling's a little different. Um, it is the best thing I've ever written. It's loaded with heart. It's loaded with thematic depth. Um, I just, I'm so very grateful for, for where it's gone, because again, I was just going to write a, a single novel. One of the greatest things about it though, is that the very first one in the original trilogy has been adapted for the screen and is actually being pitched to major streaming networks. So HBO Max, Netflix, Playtone, Imagine Entertainment, things like that. And I, that's like every author's dream to see it adapted for the screen. So Where's wood? I need some wood. Knock, knock, knock. <laughs> Very excited. Wow, that is amazing. Now, did you always have a love for sci-fi? Like, where did your passion for writing science fiction come from? Uh, I think, well, absolutely I did. I mean, I was given an assignment in second grade. Uh, and this is a long time ago, so I don't want to say the year because then I'm going to date myself. You could probably yeah. see it was a long time ago, though, from the gray in here. Uh, <laughs> My teacher in second grade gave us all an assignment and it was to pen a story, just a, a short story. And it was, you know, we all remember the construction paper cover and the college rule, you know, three line, three, three rule college, whatever you call it, yeah. um, line paper and mm -hmm. silly rudimentary drawings, cartoonish drawings, stick figures. So I, I created the electric boy. And I think I was fresh off reading the novelization for E.T. when I was a kid. So I was interested in in sci-fi and strange occurrences and all that. So I created uh, The Electric Boy. And um, and that was the very first thing that I remember creating that was my own authored work. But boy, when I stepped into Lord of the Rings by Tolkien, and I think, I, I think the first time I read that was when I was 10. I started with Lord of the Rings and then went back and read The Hobbit. It was the first thing I remember that just electrified me. Like it was, what is this? Yeah, it, this is. It's so rich with depth and breadth and heart, and it's it's massive. Uh, as, you know, and I'd read other things, so it was on a scale of which I'd never experienced before. That's fantasy, of course, but fantasy and sci-fi are very closely linked. From a very young age, I've just been a huge fan. You can tell I'm wearing my my Lord of the Rings necklace around it. This is. <laughs> This is not the one. I just want to clarify. See, I'm still here. So I'm putting yeah. my finger through it, but I'm still here. But I have my uh, family's names engraved into the, uh, my wife and my two boys' names engraved into the ring. Oh, that's awesome. I love it. I love yeah. it. Now, when when you were writing, you know, where do you get your ideas from? Like, you know, you've always had a, you know, an imagination for science fiction and adventure and 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 really developing these ideas in your head. You know, yeah. You know, everyone, you know, doesn't have the ability to take the ideas and the and the and the fantasies that come within them and put it on paper. You know, how were you? You know, what were some of your techniques to be able to like fantasize about certain adventures and actually be able to put them on paper? There's so many ways of writing. Some people plan everything out from soup to nuts, and that's very hard to do because a book kind of has a mind of its own. You know, and sometimes mm -hmm. you think you're going to be writing about something a certain way. And all of a sudden, the story takes you on a totally different journey. For yeah. you, how did you get those images and ideas on paper? And, you know, 
did it take you on a totally different, you know, pathway? Like, was it unexpected the way your stories started to go? Uh, well, how I did it was coffee, lots of <laughs> coffee all the time. Um, ultimately, I mean, I think I've just always been a dreamer, one, one foot on the the ground and, you know, one head in the clouds type of thing. I've always been um, thinking and you, you use the word you know, fantasizing. And that's really true. Just kind of fantasizing about, oh, I wonder if or what would, what would it be like? Uh, I'm thinking about ideas all the time, but it doesn't mean that I'm necessarily noting them down. And I do appreciate that for some people, the transference from your brain to paper or your brain to a, a document uh, in your laptop or desktop or whatever can be hard for some people. For me, I'm very visually inspired. So the, the thing that we watched, the direct antecedent prior to, uh, or precedent, I guess is the word, prior to um, uh, writing the very first paragraphs of Dissonance Volume 1 Reality, which was the first one I wrote, was we watched I Am Legend. And uh, my wife, I don't think I'd ever seen it. So we watched we watched I Am Legend and the earth is overrun. The earth is, you know, almost everyone is killed off because of a rabies, mm -hmm. uh, which was a byproduct of a cancer, supposed cancer vaccine. And so the earth is overrun. There's weeds growing up through the cracks that are five feet tall. Lions are roaming the street. Uh, uncontained. And I wanted some, I wanted a little bit of that anarchy of what would earth be like in 2042, 16 yeah. years after an alien invasion? Um, what kind of aliens, you know, what I have, I, I'm a, my favorite movie of all time is aliens with Sigourney Weaver. So big surprise that I wrote something about aliens. Yeah. What a shock. Um, but I think that I, I wanted something that where there had been an apocalypse and I am legend really fed into that uh, yeah. because it's it's visual. Um, I love you know big fan of it's a silly movie to some, but I really think it's it's genius. Is Independence Day in '96, mm -hmm. such a great movie. Um, so I knew I wanted something that was post apocalyptic, very dystopian, not in the Hunger Games sense, but dystopian between you know because the, it's the opposite of a utopia, yeah. and um, and. And the odds really stacked against the protagonist uh, by a creature that is multiple creatures that are tremendously deadly. I, as a little guy, was terrified out of my gourd by watching the 1981 Clash of the Titans claymation uh, stop motion photography Medusa. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anybody remembers that. I'm dating myself again, but... Uh, you know, it's claymation, so you know right away it's not real and it's not ever going to exist real. But the way that they they freeze frame her and, you know, she her eyes light up green and she goes right towards the camera, Ugh! and I ran out of the room as a little guy. And yeah. that terrifies me to this day. So I incorporated some of that into my, uh, the antagonists in the book called The Gorgons. They're called that because they have the ability, they have a telepathic paralytic. You cannot ever lock eyes with these things. So they look like this for those who are joining us via video. You cannot ever lock eyes with them because if you do, they have a telepathic paralytic. They're going to freeze you where you stand. They're going to eat you at their leisure and you're going to feel every single bite. Wow. So that's, that's what I, I was inspired by Medusa. Medusa. So now when you made your book, like, cause it, cause you had so many series so far that came out. Was it, was, did you plan on having these series or was it a story that you just kept getting mm. more ideas and you kept writing and writing and then probably maybe the editor or the publisher looked at it and said, wow, we have more than one story here, you know, like, because your imagination just took over or was it planned like that? I like the word trilogy. I mean, I, my, I love the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the Star Wars trilogy, uh, yeah. the Lethal Weapon quadrilogy, the Alien quadrilogy. I love yeah. series. So uh, Hunger Games quadrilogy. I'm really fond of those anyway. Right. But no, I I just, at the, at the outset, I seriously just wanted to write a good singular novel that was full of suspense and a thrill ride and inspiring and terrifying and, and an easy read. As I progress through the story, I'm much more of a pantser. You have pantsers and planners. So planners yeah. plot everything out with bullet points and pantsers are much more organic in their storytelling and the characters tend to lead you and yeah. art imitates life. So, you know, things happen to them and you go, oh, that could be cool. And you explore that road. And if it yeah. doesn't work, you come back and go back to the main road again. Right. Um, but there are 
there there were developments that happened in uh, in all of them, but particularly in the first one, where I went, I, I remember sitting back and going, whoa, there's a greater subtext at play here. There's a subtle undercurrent of a of a um, compelling side story that I need to explore, and so it that that and there's a development that happens in volume one where I just went, oh, okay, this is no longer only about aliens, yeah. um, and mankind is always mankind's worst enemy uh we are ourselves our worst enemy so no not really i just organically it kind of became something far greater than i thought it would be but i'm delighted that it did i'm thoroughly delighted because the story became so much more robust i love it i love it now you are you do voiceover so are you going to make these into audio and if you do make these into audio are you going to do the voiceover for all these books yeah, they're already done. Actually, the fifth one, oh. they're all available in Kindle, paperback, hardcover, and uh, an audiobook. Um, the fifth one that is with the editor, I need to get the edits back before I record it. But as a voiceover artist, yes, I do not like doing audiobooks at all. I mean, they take way too long and they pay way too little. So, yeah. but these are, you know, there there are people, I hate playing God as an author and you kill off people. You get to build and you get to construct, but you also yeah. have to destroy. Right. Um, I hate that. I don't relish that part. So in the first one, volume one reality, I had to kill off a character. It disassembled me in the writing. It disassembled me in the editing. And then you can hear it disassembling me in the narration of the audiobook. Other characters that I had to kill off, same thing. I'm just very disassembled and emotionally kind of taxed by it. I yeah. didn't feel like I would be remiss if I had if I had farmed out the voiceover aspect of these books to anyone else who had not written the book because they're my creations. Yeah. No one is going to feel as as strongly attached to these people or this story as I will. And yeah. you you hear that uh, in the audiobook. So I do lots of accents. I do primarily corporate and e-learning voiceovers, mm -hmm. but there are several accents. There's a Jamaican accent. There's British. There's Canadian. There, I want so badly wanted to do Australian and completely forgot. <laughs> um, but I'm doing all those accents in there, and they and south, you know, Southwest Texan, um, te, you know, Tennessean. It's they're they're in there. Uh, yeah. I have a blast doing it. I love it. I love it. You know, it's funny, but, you know, even though we know these characters are not real, when we start to create characters and we start to, you know, uh, create stories uh, that are, are fiction, you know, it be they become, even though they're they're not really uh, there, they become our friends. We've become attached to them because, yeah. and even though they're, they're make-believe, you know, because we spent so much time developing them you kind of get attached to those characters. It's kind of like they're real, but they're not, you know, you know what I mean? It's like you, you get the same emotional attachment than you would as you would to another human being. And m many people might not understand that, but when you sit for hours creating these characters, creating the story, and then when you're thinking about the story in your head, you're developing emotions and yeah. you know, you're really feeling the story and you're feeling you're feeling these people you know like someone's fighting you're you're feeling the anger because you're developing that anger on paper and you're writing it and you're visualizing at the same time and it's funny but your blood could be stern the same time you're writing about you know he's in battle with so and so you know what i mean like and yeah and someone gets killed off you know you become attached to that 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 character you because weep. you've been writing about that yeah and it it hits you you know mm -hmm. and it's the same thing as someone watching a movie and, they, and they're in the theater and some and the person passes away and they start crying because they've grown an emotional attachment and i think it's it probably is even worse for the writer because the writer spends so many hours developing the story and the character <laughs> and everything else what's your yeah. intake on it's, it's spot on. It's absolutely spot on. This is uh, this is ruddy uh, at the beginning of this uh, or the cover of this book, actually. And you get very attached to ruddy. You get very attached to Jet. You get very attached to Allie and um, and Joe Bassett. And, you know, were those were any of those characters to lose their lives? And there, there are people, you know, in the story who lose their lives. It's completely disassembling. I um, actually I have the characters completely fictional. I promise I'm not insane. But I have these fictional characters' birthdays in my Outlook calendar. So 
you know, June twelfth is Ruddy's birthday. October sixteenth is uh, is is Cameron's birthday. They're in my real life calendar because I want them to exist. Right. And I just took a very very surreal trip. Uh, it was kind of a pilgrimage. In fact, I actually created a website, dissonancepilgrimage.com, that forwards to my uh, my YouTube playlist. I, I visited Nashville and Clarksville, Tennessee, and Blue Spring, Kentucky over Labor Day weekend a few days ago. And I flew out there and drove all around and walked the very streets and, and visited the very buildings that my characters walked. What a mind trip. It was so surreal to be in, you know, these, it, it's almost like, it's almost seems blasphemous because you go to, you know, Israel to walk where Jesus walked uh, yeah. or, or something like that. But to walk uh, where my characters walked and to be in the very buildings that I had only ever seen on Google satellite view or Google street view. Yeah. So surreal, so surreal mm -hmm. and such a rich experience because it just brings them to life even more. And yes, yeah. you want them to exist. Yes, they do exist. Again, I promise I'm not crazy. No, I, I get it. I get it completely. You know, there are times, like I was telling you, like, you know, I would develop these stories because I have such a, a vivid imagination. And, you know, you 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 sometimes get attached to the the stories that you create in your mind because sometimes oh. they bring you to a, a level of calmness or they take you away to a, an area where it's not realistic, it's not there, but it, it lets you for, for a short period of time make believe Escape. that it's there. Yeah, yeah. it's an escape an escape and so you do become attached to those characters you create and those scenarios and and everything because you know if you if you have that type of imagination you know you can it could let it could just it could make it could it make you escape to all ends of the earth and you know yeah. it's, it's one it's a one when you talk about meditation that's a great way to meditate too you know you know Read your books uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think the quintessential person, the master of that was Tolkien, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, because, and, and he gets harped on a lot for this because he takes five paragraphs to paragraphs to describe a tree. Um, I, I think that's genius. I think it's so immersive and it's such strength of world building. Mm -hmm. And Tolkien is Tolkien because he's Tolkien. It's just, that's what yeah. he did. And so right. these books, he slaved over them for 15 years, the Lord of the Rings. And that's why you have such richness of narrative and depth and breadth where it feels Middle Earth is a place. Gandalf is a person. Um, Frodo did have the ring. The ring is this tiny little thing. And it becomes so felt and attainable. And mm -hmm. that's what I, you know, I think that's what we all strive to do if we're writing uh, reality or sorry, fiction that's grounded in reality, which yeah. mine are. They're not. My books are not, you know, sleek starships set off in space on some distant planet with the Arturions, you know, yeah. bound and and determined to kill us. No, it's <laughs> it's it's grounded in reality right here on Earth in 2026 and 2042. I love it. I love it. Now, you know, there are so many people out there that would love to, you know, I hear people all the time. I'd love, I always wanted to write a book. I always wanted to write a book, you know, and, you know, what's your advice to people? Because, you know, it, you know, it is a very uh, intense, you know, thing, you know, if people don't realize yeah. how much time and energy goes into writing a book. It's kind of like a vacuum sucks the energy out of you, but you enjoy it so much that you do it anyway. But there's a lot of time and dedication and a lot of thought process that goes into these books. But, you know, for someone who, you know, in the back of their head says, wow, I have a great story that I would love to share with the world. You know, yeah. and I just, you know, I've always wanted to write a book. What would be your response to them? Uh, I love the phrase in 15 years, what will you look back and wish you had done? Do it now. Um, yeah. And that's my advice is do it now. But there's several, there's several precautions to take when you do it now or, or anytime you do it. Um, yeah. Number one, I'm a huge fan of self-publishing. Traditional publishers are just going to wait forever with self. They're, they're going to take a while before you can even hit the market with it. Yeah. Self-publishing, you can get a lot faster. You can command higher royalties. You can retain creative control. You can choose your own marketing and graphic design and editing team and all of that. And I love the the oversight that you can have. If you have a change because you have a typo, which has never happened to me, uh, <laughs> you always discover typos and you're reading it's five years after release. You go, what? Ah, and then you can republish. You don't have to go through any channels. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, very easy to do. But two things. One, um, 
please stay away from AI. Uh, please avoid AI. If you use AI for supplemental works, like uh, to think of an idea, which I, I'm not, I don't frown on that, but I don't like it at the same time. Yeah. Um, if you use AI to generate some images of characters that don't exist in real life, but to help people visualize them in promotional materials, fine. But Please don't use chat GPT and open AI and any of those tools to write a story for you. It's cheating. Yeah. You're mm -hmm. sacrificing your God-given gift to create. And it's it's just kind of, I'm going to put the word despicable on it because people are going to chat GPT. They're saying, tell me a long story about blah, blah, blah. It does. You copy paste, you slap a cover on it. And then now you're a capitalist and you're, you're basically uh making money off something a computer did i think it's really lame yeah. um you have a creative gift use that don't stoop to ai and the reason i say that is because i am a full-time voiceover artist ai mm -hmm. is completely eroding the voiceover industry as it is many creative industries it's actually pushed me back stronger into writing books and novels uh, because it's eroding and I'm pivoting, I'm adapting and overcoming. Yeah. So av avoid AI. Two, you don't need to be the next Suzanne Collins or Isaac Asimov or Stephen King or uh, you know Tolkien or anybody. Yeah. Be yourself. Um, it's okay to pay homage to them, mm -hmm. a tip of the hat here and there. But yeah. Oscar Wilde said, uh, "Be yourself." Everyone else is already taken, and I right. love that phrase. Yeah. Um, and the third and final thing is I love this phrase. I'm going to show a little plaque I had made and I'll, I'll just say what it was. But this comes from a movie I like to pretend does not exist. Star Wars, The Phantom Menace. Mm -hmm. And Qui-Gon Jinn says to a young Anakin Skywalker, your focus determines your reality. That's, right. I, that's my mantra. So mm -hmm. my focus is writing great books and that eventually becoming our livelihood. That yeah. is my absolute focus and it will eventually be my absolute reality as voiceovers became yeah Those i things. love it and you know what it, it's so true you know you can't rely on ai to write your book that is cheating and you know what it, it's it's not the same quality you know a human oh. ai cannot communicate compete with a human's mind you know it's just I you, you could see the quality the difference you know and i've seen people do that and i'm just like right away it's like you know, can tell i can yeah. tell i can tell and the same thing goes with you know with the ai voice you know i've tr i've tried them out to see what they they're like and you know what i want a human i want yeah. to hear his voice i don't want to hear a robotic voice and and they've gotten better like there are some softwares out there that sound very human and there yeah. are a lot of there are a lot of people using that that ai voiceover but it's still not exactly perfection and it's still not a human you know are we going to let robots take over the world you know it, it's yeah. it's and that's what we're doing. You know, everybody has a mind, you know, dive deep into it and, and have confidence in yourself and let your mind go wild. And, and whatever your passion is, whatever you love to do, let your mind just develop and create because that's what it's for, you know, not to yeah. use a computer to do it for you. That's what makes you human. I mean, you can use your mind for math or you can use a calculator, which isn't a moral, uh, a moral, um, compromise of any kind it's just for the people who yeah. are not math equipped but but yeah absolutely and i i went like this and just demonstrated the hairs rising on my arm you can always tell when a voice is not human you can always tell there are subtle inflections and nuances and things like that we just what huh it just seems a little bit off it's the yeah. same thing with a poorly executed deep fake uh, right just saw alien romulus not going to spoil it but there is a really, eh, I mean, it's believable at certain points, but it's, it is, it is not a 100%, um, you know, solidly executed deep fake. And, yeah. and it's just, you can always tell, obviously, you know, the character uh, and the actor who portrays him are dead. Right. So they can only bring him back now via a deep fake. However, even in, um, a Carrie Fisher in the in Rogue One for Star Wars, they bring her back, and you know she's already she's deceased. Yeah. Um, I think she was deceased by that time, but that kind of thing you're using a computer to do what a a human should do. Find a yeah. Carrie Fisher lookalike. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I just think it, there's such a, we can always tell. And I think we'll be able to tell for a very long time, but you are right. The voices are getting better. I'm not going to say her name because she's right there, but A-L-E-X-A, she's getting, mm-hmm. she's all throughout our home and she sounds really real. Yeah. No. Oh. And I do like, I do like being able to self-publish better than traditional. I've done both. And I do feel that self-publishing gives you so much more control. And you also, you know, for people who have devoted so much time and effort and they want to monetize and they want to make some money off of their, their book, you know, and because the book is really to help people, to give people joy. You know, we, the, the purpose, we, we write a book for a purpose, you know, and that's our main goal. And then, you know, it's always nice to monetize off of it. But, you know, yeah. when, you, when you bring it to a traditional publishing company, they might give you an advance, you know, but like you said, you have to wait forever, you know, and most of the times the royalty is nothing, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, and you don't, you don't, they don't do a lot of marketing and a lot of things that they promise, you know, maybe if you're Prince Harry or if you're, you know, like an A-class, you know, actor, you might get a few more perks, but for, for regular people, you know, regular authors, you know, it's, it's, you don't have many advantages where if you self-publish, you could actually, you know, self-publish, have control, have control of the price too. And also you could distribute worldwide. You can, you know, if you yeah. understand the, the publishing process, you don't have to just have your book in, in one area. You could have it in multiple, you know, retail um, stores and have it, you know, distributed worldwide and, and have the availability to have it everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. I, th- that's another perk. I mean, and the other thing is basically um, you talk about marketing. Um, yes, a traditional publisher will take care of marketing and marketing is a specter for a lot of people like, oh, I want to do, don't want to do the marketing. Chill out. I mean, it's just you're excited about something. You're going to tell people about it. That's the difference right there. And the best counsel I was ever given by anybody in authoring and I wish I could remember who it was. I feel terrible about this. So I'm just going to say I, I said it, and this is my quote. Um, as I've always said, um, I love the phrase, the best thing about, or the best thing to do with marketing is don't market. Be an yeah. enthusiast. Mm-hmm. So marketing, people love to buy. They hate to be sold. So yes. I do uh, I do booths all the time at craft fairs and vendor markets. And I just, man, I cleaned, I cleaned house. Is that the phrase? I cleaned up and cleaned house this past weekend at Olympia, uh, Washington's Harbor Days. Yeah. Sold, sold 100 books on the nose over three days. Yeah. And they they love, people love to buy, they hate to be sold. I can always tell when I'm marketing to someone, but yeah. enthusiasm is contagious. It's contagious. Yeah. Don't be a marketer, be an enthusiast. Exactly. I'm tremendously enthusiastic about this whole series. I'm so enthusiastic about the screenplay and that enthusiasm yeah. carries and exactly. that's what sells books, not the marketing. No, I agree a hundred percent. And many times I, I would sell more books when I go to events and, you know, if I did a speaking event or if I had a booth, you know, people would flock to the booth and like, what's this? And then, yeah. you know, so enthusiastic about your own writing you get into it you tell the story you know you explain things and then right away I remember one time I brought 500 books I came home with four you know and and wow, it was, that's great it was you know it was crazy but you know I sell sometimes really I sell more books when I go to events than I do anywhere else because yeah. you know, people meet the author they they see who the author is and that enthusiasm and that energy just rubs off on, on the person and they they you know they like you they want to they want to learn more about what you're about and and your stories and you know what you have to offer and you know and that's the that's the hook right there is just you know they see who the real person is they they like the real person and then they draw trust and they and then they they see the product and it's like yeah this sounds great you know yeah yeah, absolutely. I'm a storyteller. I, I tell other people's stories in there in my voiceover booth, and I tell mm-hmm. my own stories right here. And right. Um, you're also a storyteller when you're out there selling your books. You're telling the story of the story. And yeah. so that is such a great opportunity to tell people what has captivated you over you know uh, weeks, months, years writing this book. Uh, yeah. or these books. And it's a chance for you to really sow seeds of yearning into people's hearts to be part of this enthusiast bandwagon that you're on. Right. Um, and I just, I, I'm so enthusiastic. It's, I, I just go out there and I really try to not wrangle people in, but 
um, I tell people want to hear a really cool story, come on in. And, yeah. and they do, you know, not all of them, of course, some people see the banners and they go, well, I'm not a sci-fi fan. Well, that's fine. Uh, there's love. Come back. There's love in here. No, um, <laughs> there's romance. It's a Western and it's a, and it's a, yeah. Um, I don't do that's ch like cheap advertising and misleading. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the enthusiasm that always carries and latches people in. And they go, uh, yes, sounds really, they always say, sounds really interesting. I'd like to buy this or the whole set. And, oh, it's so cool. I My next one is next Saturday. Uh, but I've been in, I'm in Barnes and Noble. And so I've got a, another signing in Barnes and Noble in October. Uh, people do love meeting the author and finding out the person behind the story and what compelled you to write it. Right. No, it's, it's very an honor. Yeah, it really is. It's you know, it, book writing is is such a thing. I always I always enjoyed um, writing books because it was uh, for me. It was like you know, I wrote nonfiction, so you know, the the topics I I wrote about touched many people's hearts and helped others. You know, mm -hmm. and you know what? And the, and with fiction, it it does the same because you're you're taking people away into a world that it, you know that brings them joy. It it, it stirs their imagination. You know, yeah. it's you know, it's, 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 it's healthy in so many ways. If you think about it, it's like, you know, you can escape, like you said earlier, you know, it's an escape to a world that, that is so intriguing, you know, and it's, it's nice sometimes to escape planet earth because there's many times that I, I do want to escape planet earth, you know, and a fiction yeah. book is a great way to do it, you know, maybe this year, actually, this particular <laughs> year. Yeah. yeah. The escape is a great word, but it's also very cathartic and therapeutic. Um, it's almost medicinal, you know, reading a book and reading a good story. We love stories. We love to be told stories. That's yeah. why we love movies so much. That's why we love books. And anything right. that is um, – now, here, here's the rub for those people who write sci-fi that's actually more grounded in reality because you're crossing a bridge there. Um, right. And, and some people have a hard time straddling that bridge, one foot in the world, one foot in the – uh, in the fictional world. Yeah. Um, I, I like that people, some people need a cleaner break. Like right. instead of earth of 2024, Oh, let's write it on, uh, like, uh, alpha Centauri in the year 3796, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, that's a big break for yeah. me. I don't, I, I like the grounded in reality. I like star Wars more than star Trek because star Wars has the, 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 metal panels on the millennium falcon are dripping oil out of them because han solo is just trying to bang on it and keep it working i love i love the grounded in reality nature of of my own sci-fi and those are the ones that attract me more no i love that now for people who are out there you know do you have any advice for them like if you have you know if people wanted to maybe dip into you know um into writing because they don't have to write a a, a you know a large you know non-fiction book or a non you know or a or a fiction book you know they can write a short story you know and even i think yeah. um you know amazon has an area where you can write short stories or you know you could even you know create a little book you know like a, a small little book to download and then have like a series a little series going on you know you know yep. what's your what's your advice for people who you know have a, a urge to want to write but they they don't know if they should or they don't think they can and and so forth yeah well kindle vela is what you're referring to for the novellas and the short story sections of kdp um, I actually, you know, in terms of self-publishing and writing, I, I did publish a book called, it's a very lengthy title actually, so I don't even remember what it is, but it's a, it's called, you know, how to self-publish and market your book, uh, a business guide for the self-published author. I right. wanted to cram as many keywords in there as I could. Um, so that book's there, I mean, as a help, but ultimately it's, it's the same advice that, uh, we talked about earlier. It's just that one big thing people mistake writing and self-publishing as something that's going to demand all this money from them. It isn't. You right. could do everything for absolutely zero dollars. You could do mm -hmm. everything, write it all yeah. on your computer, publish it all digitally. Uh, and they're a print on demand service. So it's not going to cost you anything unless you order author copies um, right. and they ship them to you, but write something compelling. This is again, going back to the advice of don't try to, be the next J.R.R. Tolkien, write yeah. something that you like. Right. Um, write something that you are comfortable with and write it compellingly. 
And uh, and if you aren't a novelist, if you feel like, oh, dude, 350 pages, no way. How about how about 20 to start with? There's a place for you in in um, avenues like Kindle Vela for sure. Right. Um, another thing though is that I, I run a, a 32,000 member uh, author group on Facebook. Um, it's called Authors and Writers Only, all caps only. Um, mm -hmm. The scammers and spammers are out there. The groups are replete with them, but not ours. We're really good at policing them. Mm -hmm. um, but the, boy, so many times you hear um, uh, aspiring authors and writers voice this common refrain. I just don't have the money to, to self-publish my book. And there's two things wrong with that. Number one, it doesn't cost anything usually if you, if you do it the right way. And number yeah. two, even if it did, your mindset needs to change because every expense is not an expense at all. It is an investment. Exactly. If you really want to be an author, then treat every expense, which is short-term as an investment, which is long-term. So right. 20 bucks on a banner, you know, 50 bucks on a few author copies of your books. Those are all investments uh, right. into your own business of being an author. You have to develop a business mindset uh, yeah. and do it the right way. Cause you're going to make either coffee bucks as a hobbyist, or you're going to make uh, you know, business revenue as exactly. treating it as an entrepreneurship. Right. hundred percent, hundred percent. Now, if you had to take everything we talked about today and you want to emphasize on some important factors that we talked about your book and we talked about other topics related to book writing, is there anything that you'd like to emphasize to the listeners today? Uh, oh boy. Um, I think the biggest thing that I've learned as an author is just, uh, it doesn't need to take forever. Uh, and, and people will be shocked by this too. People are shocked when I voice it, but I, uh, I've published all four of these novels this year. Uh, the fifth one will be published this year. The sixth one may be published this year. We'll see. But ultimately, when a story is compelling, when it wants to tell itself, it's going to burst out of you like an alien queen. Yeah. And there I go talking about aliens again. But <laughs> it's just like alien brain. <laughs> it, it wants to be told and it, it doesn't need to take forever now, if you want, if you're the kind of person that needs to slow marinate everything and crock pot your stories, that's okay. Let it take as long as it needs to, but man, don't drag your feet. This is a hope and a goal and a dream. And yeah. I feel like as a voiceover artist, I'm running a little bit on borrowed time. What with the, the damage that AI has done. Yeah. Um, I don't have any time to spare. My fingers are flying on the keyboards creating great stories and getting them edited well. And these right. are full size. These are all, you know, roughly 330 pages, except this behemoth, which was the finale uh, is 431 pages. Wow. And I, I did a ton of research on all of them um, just militarily, uh, you know, Google landmarks and, and all that stuff. And, do your research, do your due diligence, but man, start hammering out that story and see where it leads you. You don't need to take till you only got till 2026 anyway, because that's when the Gorgons come. You want to get it published before then. So come on. I Good love it. On. Now, where can people find your books? <laughs> I love this question. So I love the question A because I get to share it, but it's you can go to author Aaron Ryan .com. Mm -hmm. You can go to the series website, which is dissonancetheseries.com, but dissonance is too hard to spell and people spell, people think it's dissidence. It's not dissidence. So an easier way to remember is go to getthesebooks.com. Oh, I love it. <laughs> That's an investment. I didn't have to buy that website through GoDaddy, but that website is easy to remember. Getthesebooks.com will forward you to the dissonance series. Um, so Air, author Aaron Ryan .com or get these books.com. And all my social links are at the bottom of, uh, of each page there. I love it. I love it. This has been amazing, Aaron. You know, <laughs> I just, I love, you know, you were great today. You're, you know, first of all, you're very talented and I'm amazed yeah. how you, you were able to get all these books out in such a short period of time. And they are all doing extremely well and selling very well in the book market. And, you know, and all your advice today was so inspirational. I, you know, it, you really inspired a lot. I, a lot of people, I think today who want to write, but just don't know where to begin. 
and or are afraid to but you know you did make a very good point it's an investment and that's how they people have to look at it if you want to yeah. do it as a hobby or do you want to do it as a career and that's the choice you have to make and uh you know a lot of the information you provided today was outstanding and i just love your creativity and you know i, I think <laughs> I think you're a great guy and, and it's wonderful to have you on the show. And I hope you'll be back one day to, you know, we can talk a little more in, in depth about a lot of these topics that we hit today. Love to. Yeah. Let's do it before the, the Gorgons come though. They come That's on not... June 6th, 2026. So we have time. All right. That sounds great. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Aaron. It's been wonderful. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. You have a great day. You too.